thanks a lot Ajit, for joining us today and uh, hello everyone welcome to product talks by pragmatic leaders so today we are going to discuss the five tactical tips for early stage product managers with adel before moving ahead i would like to give you all a little brief about his journey so far so uh, he is currently working uh, working at western governors university from past 11 years uh, he started his journey as a scheduler there and he is currently working as a senior principal product manager so uh, before that he also started an edtech venture in 2014 and he worked as a founder there for 4 years apart from this he specializes in online learning delivery procuring and lot more so let's start the session and i would like you to take the session forward from here absolutely um good evening good morning um good whenever you're watching this uh, on the recording uh, my name is adel lelo and correct i'm the senior principal product manager at western governors university um and over the past uh, decade or so i've had the pleasure um and privilege to work with uh, a lot of different stakeholders and see the university kind of uh, go from a small uh, online college to uh, a university with an enrollment of more than 100,000 students more than 100,000 graduates um my role at western governors is to oversee the portfolio of assessment delivery technologies which includes the online proctoring uh, site delivery uh, basically anything that has to do with assessments and technology now at western governors university our product management department per se is still pretty new uh reason being that we used to function as a as a product management team unofficially before we officially made it a product management team so what i'm going to talk to you about today are the 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 kind of five tips or five things that i have learned over the past decade that have uh worked for me from the perspective of tactics to uh, or in order to get things done to basically build the software we need for the students that our university is serving now if we look at kind of what what it means to be a product manager uh, there's always that same definition and that's that that of a mini ceo i like to simplify it a little bit further than that myself um, what i always tell the teams around me especially the product management teams is that the product manager or the product management department is where things get done um it is the only department in just about any company where from which you can never look at somebody else or another department or another person and and wait for anyone else to get things done if it happens if it will happen at a company at a university in our case it has to happen in the product management department so i really like this definition of a mini ceo over a product over a range of products if you will so let's just dive right into it now to preface everything i i do want to um um tell everyone that these five that that i had to narrow down drastically to come up with five uh, are my experiences i haven't read these in any books uh, i this is not official this is just what i have learned over the years uh, and what has worked for me so let's just kind of dive right into them the number one thing i would say and while these are not in order of importance i would still say that this is probably the most important thing that i've learned uh, from a tactical perspective of building products and that is to develop trust with stakeholders um this means the decision makers on your side this means uh, your programmers this means your developers this means anyone and everyone who has any kind of buy in that has any kind of uh input into the development and the final outcome of your products things will not always be smooth things will not always go well i am yet to work on a project where everybody agrees that it's the right thing to do and even once we agree that it's the right thing to do i'm yet to work on a project where everyone agrees exactly how to do it the right way so i have learned early and i would encourage you to very early on in your careers establish relationships with all of your stakeholders uh learn what motivates them not everyone is just motivated by coming to work and getting things done for the sake of a paycheck most people choose the companies they work at because they believe in their in their vision they believe in in their mission they believe in 
in, in showing up and doing something great. Uh, do not be afraid to fail. This I cannot stress enough, and it leads me right into the next one, which is own your mistakes. If there is one easy, quick way to lose trust from your stakeholders is to run away from your mistakes. So if you fail, make sure everybody knows that you are owning the mistakes because next time around when uh, it is time to make decisions, when it is time to build uh, new products, people will know that they can trust you. They will know that you will not uh, run away from your mistakes. So again, number one, develop those trusts, develop those relationships um, because there will be times when you will be texting or emailing or calling some of your stakeholders at 10 p.m., 11 p.m., midnight, because things are going awfully bad, very bad, uh, and you will not be able to do that with someone or to someone whom you do not have a personal relationship with. This will also help you overcome any um, disagreements or, or, or misalignments uh, going forward. Now, tip number two, and this is a very obvious one, this is not even a tactical one, but it helps with the num with the first tip, uh, which is uh, to um, develop these relationships and build the trust, is to become an expert. I like to say to all of our product managers, uh, when they walk into a room of stakeholders, that the product manager or senior principal product manager, whatever it, whatever the title is, as long as it's within the product management department, needs to be the number one expert on this thing in the room. In my case, I got lucky because I've been in the same field, in the same industry for over a decade now. That's not always the case. Uh, we see new product managers being thrown into our uh, structure all the time, uh, and I see this happen across companies everywhere, where your job as a product manager is to build products, build software, but it is not in a field you are already passionate about, in a field you're already familiar with. So the easiest way to gain trust and to get the buy-in from your stakeholders is to let them know or uh, make sure they know that they're talking to an expert. You should be, as a product manager, the number one expert in any room on your product, obviously, but beyond just the product. You need to be the number one expert in that in that room on the, the the market within which that product exists. So know your competition, know what everyone else is doing, which leads me to the last point, which is that is to know your customers. Now, when I say know your customers, I don't mean just simply a, a series of interviews with your customers and asking them for what they want. I will talk about that a little bit more on my next slide. But know what their end goals are. Uh, get familiar with their whys. Get familiar with um, what problems they have. Not how you need to solve those problems, but what the problems are. Fall in love with the problems. Uh, search social media. In today's world, it's very easy for us to go online and, and get the feedback of thousands of people without ever asking them a question because you can go on to social media and read between the lines of what problems are, what problems you're trying to, to resolve. So always very, very important. Um, once you have built those relationships and once you have built trust with your stakeholders, make yourself the foremost expert in your field, on your product, within the marketplace, so that when you say something in a meeting or in a proposal, people know that they are talking to someone who knows what he or she is talking about. Now, I said a little bit that you should know your customers and know what they want. I would encourage, and I've learned this over the years, um, you need to listen to your customers, but don't listen to them too much, right? This is where the expertise come into play. Know your customers' needs. There's a famous Henry Ford quote that says, uh, if I had asked people what they wanted, they would have said a faster horse, or they would have said faster horses. Your customers don't always know what they want, which then in turn means that your stakeholders internally do not always know what they want. So you can see these kind of go hand in hand. Once you have developed the relationships, once you have developed 
the trust, once you've gained the trust of your stakeholders, um, you make yourself an expert in the field, which helps with the other. And now suddenly, as the expert, you can focus more on fixing the problems and not just sitting back and becoming an order taker, so to say, um, and just executing plans that somebody else is doing. Uh, this establishes you as, as an expert in your field. This establishes you as someone who knows your customers' needs, not just immediate wants. So I hope that makes sense. Listen to your customers, absolutely, always. But not too much, if that makes sense. I know that goes against a lot of product management kind of wisdom out there. Now, probably the number one properly tactical way to get things done because remember at the end of the day our job is to get things done we are measured by by how much we get done how we can solve the problems that are existent within our marketplaces that are existent within our companies that are existent uh, amongst our customers right so i'm yet to work with a group of people with a smart group of people who will let anyone dictate to them that they did not have the best idea in the room. I think it's just human nature, right? We all like to believe that we are correct and that our ideas are the best ideas. So it becomes a combination of science and art when regardless of what the plan is, regardless of what the idea is or whose idea it is, because it very well could be your idea most of the time, because again, we're going back to number one, two, and three, which is that you are an expert in your field, so you should know what your customers need, not what your customers want. But once that idea has been formalized, once that idea has been agreed upon, it is absolutely vital to continue getting the buy-in from your internal customers, from your stakeholders, from your decision makers. And I think tactically, the, the one thing that has always worked for me, the one thing that I see work all the time is to make your customers, rather your internal stakeholders, your decision makers, believe without lying to them, but make them believe it is their idea. They are much more likely to get bought into uh, the execution of your plan if they believe that they have uh, built and if they believe that they have uh, created and, and they have come up with the ideas that you are executing. So make sure there's alignment there. Uh, make sure you always listen when they give you feedback and tactically implement or add and include the ideas that they're giving you, whether directly or indirectly, but it is extremely important. I have not seen anything that ruins a big project quicker and easier and on a more fabulously dramatic and large scale than when there are competing ideas and there's one winner and one loser. There can never be one winner and one loser. You have to include all of your customers, internal customers, feedback and ideas and make them believe that no matter how little or how much of the total idea, the total product roadmap was actually contributed by them, they feel like it is theirs and they want to move forward. Because remember, our focus is on outcomes. If we want to focus on who gets credit for what, we're in the wrong profession, right? Our number one focus is and always should be what happens at the end who benefits, which should be ideally our customers, not so much important whose idea and who gets credit for what idea. Now, I mentioned that the easiest way uh, that I've seen that leads teams to fail um, are competing ideas and not getting people's buy-in. Another very, very easy way to kill an idea, to kill a product before it ever even gets off the ground is getting too many people involved too soon. I can't even count the number of times that I have, when I have called big meetings uh, in front of uh, dozens and dozens of people, 
and I presented an idea or, or a process or a problem or some kind of a plan to build something or fix something. And within that group, the larger the group, the, more, the higher likelihood that someone or some ones within that group will not agree with you. And this is especially important if those some ones are decision makers, senior uh, executives at your company. So the, the, the approach I use and the approach uh, that has worked for me uh, most of the time and, and the approach I always encourage others to use is to forget this idea of having a large group and presenting to that whole group uh, at the same time your ideas. I prefer to much rather work in very small groups. So for example, if I know that I am rolling out a, a product roadmap in a couple of weeks, and I know that I need the buy-in of three, four, five senior executives at my company, the absolutely worst thing that I have seen, easiest way to, to kill the idea before it gets off the ground is to call them all in one room and show to all of them at the same time what our plan is. There was, without doubt, always one person at least who had doubts, who had an issue with your plan, with your approach, with your idea, with the process. And as a result, that one or two, one person or two people rile up the rest of the group. And next thing you know, your idea, your product, your process, your project roadmap is going absolutely nowhere. Instead, I've always preferred to start in much smaller groups. When it comes to senior executives, I actually prefer to talk to them one-on-one. -on -one. So if I'm, if I'm rolling something out, or an idea, a project a, a charter, a, a product roadmap, anything in a couple of weeks, what I will do is between now and then talk to each one of these people individually and get them to buy in. Now, when we do eventually, get to that larger meeting where everybody's involved or in that larger email chain when everybody is involved, um, they're already all bought in. They just don't know it. And if someone has issues with your approach, with your idea, with your um, uh, product roadmap, with, with your solution to an issue, you will know that in advance. So if I know that, that, that Mike, let's just use a random name here, uh, does not agree with the way I plan to roll out my next product, I will know that in advance and I will have answers for Mike by the time we get to that larger meeting, which means that then Mike, again, making up a name, is not polluting the waters, so to say, within that larger meeting that will then get the rest of your stakeholders riled up and start, uh, start doubting yeah. I can hear some some background noise there. So, in short, in in kind of to recap everything, um, and these are it was very very difficult to just kind of use five. And again, um, it is absolutely important to to remember and realize that uh, I'm using these from my personal experiences, from a personal life over the over the ten last ten years. Um, and I've seen them go right and I've seen them go wrong. So to kind of recap, it is your products will never go smooth. Let me take that back. Once in a while, they will go smooth. But you will never get everybody on the same page to buy in and execute your ideas as, as you want. So it is absolutely vital to build relationships with your customers and more importantly with your stakeholders internally so that when you do disagree and you will disagree quite a bit if it's an effort worth undertaking, um, it comes from a point of or from a from a perspective of of respect. Um, if you're an expert in your field, uh, you will automatically gain a lot of that respect. Um, listen to your customers, but not too much, because a lot of the times they're focused more on the immediate solution, whereas you need to think more long term. And from a tactical perspective, I think it's absolutely vital, absolutely important, and absolutely necessary to keep your actual teams, your working groups, your feedback groups as small as possible. You can have multiple small teams instead of one large team when you're showing uh, your ideas and when you're showing your approach to the, the uh, solutions of the problems at hand. 
So that is all I have for you um, prepared. I think we'll have some time to um, answer any questions uh, and take it from there. Uh, hi. Hello. Hi, so I'm Kushagra and uh, uh, some uh, 11 months back uh, I joined a startup which is in uh, language learning domain and this is catering to vernacular audience of India and uh, I joined there as the first product manager of that startup and for me also this was my first product management experience. Uh, what I wanted to know from you is, uh, is, it, is it a smarter, is it a smarter idea to, to be to, to have a clarity on five to 10 products which you will like to build for a particular company before even joining the company so that uh, in first 10, 15 days, you have more uh, contextual discussion with all internal stakeholders? Uh -huh. Really good question. Um, so while we have built and developed products at Western Governors for since I've been there, we the actual product management department is kind of new. So I know exactly what you're, where you're coming from. So here's, here's my answer to that. It is a very good idea to have a list of products and or ideas that you would like to execute and build to get hired, right? But you already done that. I think there is a danger if you come into a company uh, with already predetermined or made, and you made up your mind what that company needs, what, the, what those products need, there is a danger of not taking in the information that your customers are giving you. In this case, your customers, I'm not even talking about external customers, but internal customers or stakeholders. Um, it, and I'll, I'll get to this, it's kind of a balancing act from my perspective. So if your mind is made up on what they need, before you get in, because I think you've probably already learned that what they look like from the outside, um, maybe it's not, you're not the same thing once you're in and you learn the inner ins and outs and the actual problems um, and, and how the sausage is made, so to say. Um, if you make up your mind too early, you might not be receptive to the feedback and you might not be receptive to learning new problems as you're, as you're working there, right? So that's a risk. At the same time, I love to pick the brains of new people that join us because sometimes you get tunnel vision, right? If you've been with a company for too long, you get tunnel vision and you already, you think you know what you need to do, you think you know what you need to fix and you think you know exactly how you need to fix it. When in reality, you don't get a fresh perspective. So I do think it is very beneficial that while you're still brand new, you take inventory and you take your time to learn what the actual in, uh, problems are from the inside. At the same time, this is the newest you will ever be at that company, right? And this is the freshest perspective you will ever have. So I do think it's important and helpful to come in with those ideas, but do not get tunnel vision to say, this is those, these are the solutions to these problems before you have the time to learn from the inside what the actual problems are. I hope that made sense. I know I kind of uh, went on there for a while. It does. Uh, thanks a lot. Oh, um, yeah, I, I understand what you're saying. Uh, one more thing, like uh, in the first week itself, for someone who has just joined a company as a PM, uh, so what I did in my first week was I was mostly around, I was I mostly dedicated my time into looking into funnel, looking into data, and did some user interviews. But what I didn't do then back then was I, I didn't pick up a problem and thought that, okay, let's, let me solve it in first week itself. Uh, mm -hmm. what, what do you ideally expect from your PM in the first week if you have hired someone? Yeah. So that's a, another great question. So I think you can hire a PM for multiple reasons, right? Uh, mainly two reasons. One is they can be a really good product manager meaning the skill set of product management, which is developing plans, executing, communicating, the whole nine yards, right? And that, in that case, it's independent of what the company does, right? Because you're hiring them for, the, for, for their skills as product managers. The other reason you can hire a PM is because they are an expert in their market, right? So let's say you're building um, chains. Um, you can hire a product manager to build chains because he or she is an absolute expert in chains. That doesn't mean they're very good at product management itself. So what I always like to see uh, the first week or the first even month, because let's face it, a week is usually not enough time, at, at least in, in our industry, is to see that product manager 
get caught up on the area that in which they're not good. So if I'm hiring someone to build me a, a, a monitor, a computer monitor, and they are an expert in the field of product management, but not an expert in building monitors, I would expect them to study up on building monitors during the first week, not the skill set of product management. At the same time, we have hired many people who are experts in their field. So in this case, he is an expert in building monitors, but he's not an expert in the day-to-day -day processes of product management. In that case, we ask them or we'd like to see them study up on the actual process of product management, of building a roadmap, of communicating with stakeholders, oh, of learning who the stakeholders are. So basically, um, get caught up on the part that they are short on. Now, one last point, and this is one week is probably way too too short of a time frame, but I'm a huge, huge fan, and this couldn't make my top five list, I'm a huge fan in small wins, right? So instead of building one big project and then working the next six months to roll out this one thing, I'm a huge fan of small wins because that again gets trust with your stakeholders and your decision makers. Um, if within the first month you can roll out something, it doesn't have to be a proper product, it can just be an addition or a change or subtraction in some cases from a product that is currently a pain point, get a quick win early just get a quick win. It could be tiny little win, just get it quick. Maybe get two people who have never agreed on something to agree on something in your first week. That is a big win. If you um, if you watch sports, for example, it's always important. They always, I watch a lot of basketball and soccer and other sports, but it, it is very interesting to see that whoever gets a positive score first, the, the whole momentum of the game switches. It, it is after that score very easy to see that the team who scored early is a lot more confident, is a lot more uh, confident of, of getting a result, of winning that day. I think it's the same thing in, in life and especially in product management. So get a quick win and also I would suggest working on the one area where you're not strong uh, because you probably got hired because of one or the other. You're a good product manager or you're good at uh, in that specific space, whichever one you're not good at, focus on working on that in the beginning. That That is uh, actually awesome. Like, thanks a lot. This helps. Absolutely. Pleasure. Hi, Adele. Um, I had a question uh, on your second slide. Um, well, this was around uh, owning mistakes. Mm -hmm. My question was around, uh, so so maybe you made maybe some sort of a commitment. Okay, basically, you've owned a mistake. Uh, I understand that, you know, if you own your mistake, uh, it may look like, you know, okay, someone is vulnerable and it's okay to be vulnerable. But I'm just looking at it from a stakeholder perspective that he has made a mistake, he has owned it. But I'm just trying to look into how do we gain the trust of people uh, as to um, he may not do this again. Mm -hmm. Excellent, excellent question. So it is better to, don't get me wrong, it is better to not make a mistake than make a mistake. But we do, we, we are humans and we live in a, in a world where that is um, not possible. So uh, your question is actually one that I think every company struggles with. Um, our CEO likes to say that, I don't mind if you make a mistake, I, just don't make it twice, just like you said. So I think your question is, if I screwed up your product today, uh, how do you trust me that I won't screw it up the next time? That is, it's a tricky one because that, that means we'll, we have to learn from our mistakes. What we do um, at Western Governors is, is a series of uh, COEs, uh, uh, meaning correction of errors. So whenever a major mistake was made, whenever we have an outage, whenever we have uh, a big failure of, of sorts, uh, we go through a process called a correction of errors, which means we're documenting what the errors were and we're filing this away so that we know and we learn from our mistakes. We're not learning from them because we're putting it in a file somewhere. We're learning from them because uh, we asked uh, the, what we call the five whys, right? which is why did this happen? 
Well, because A, B, and C. All right, why did A, B, and C happen? Because A, B, and C. Why did this happen? So you keep going down further and further um, until you get to the point, the actual root cause of the problem. Again, it is helpful because we can file it away and we know later what happened, but it's also extremely helpful because the people who made the mistake, which is all of us, I, I make them daily, um, they get to go through the exercising and they get to realize why they what went wrong. So uh, it's a good question. Uh, if it is a matter of trust and if someone makes a mistake, owns their mistake, I think from a business owner's perspective, let's put it this way. If I'm your product manager and I screwed up your product and then I try to hide it, you later find out I made the mistake, obviously, because your product is not working the way you want it, right? you know I screwed up and I'm trying to hide it, you're probably less likely to trust me with your next product than if I screwed it up and I come to you and I say I screwed it up and here is how I'm going to fix it, here's how I'm going to correct it. Um, so what I'm trying to say, it's a matter of trust. The own your mistakes portion is an exercise that builds trust with your stakeholders. You will not like it either way. You will not like it whether I make the mistake and then try to hide it because your product isn't working properly. You will not like it if I uh, make the mistake and come to you and tell you I made the mistake. But those are the only two options. And one helps build trust, whereas the other one uh, it helps build suspicion, if, any, if nothing else. So it, it is the better of the two. Um, I have a six-year-old daughter and um, it's easy, you know, she's in that, at that age where she, you know, she's trying to, you know, let's say, face it, lie, right? Kids start lying at that age. And it is very easy to see when, when, she, when she tries to hide something. Um, and, and then I know what signs to look for uh, to know whether she's telling me the truth or not. So between the two options, don't get me wrong, best to not make a mistake, but not possible. You will probably trust me more if I make the mistake and come to you because I'm building trust with you than make the mistake and try to hide it. Does, does that make sense? There's no perfect answer there. There's no perfect way to, to go about it. Um, and I do think it's very important to study why the mistake was made. In our case, like I said, we do the a COE, correction of errors, uh, which includes the five whys, where we get to the bottom of why the mistake happened. Um, but there are multiple approaches out there that, that can be taken to get to the bottom of this. Did that answer your question? Absolutely. You were spot on. Another point um, uh, which you mentioned on your last slide was on the, uh, on the, if you can just go to slide number eight. There we go. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So um, in your example, you mentioned that uh, there are different stakeholders when we actually to talk in terms of a roadmap or uh, a roadmap for perhaps next year or, um, or, or a couple of quarters ahead. Uh, so it would be better if we speak to them individually, get uh, discuss on these points and tactically uh, get them to uh, include their thoughts also when we discuss these points. So just thinking around, uh, in case stakeholders know that you know this is in line with, uh, so say for example for this particular year we discussed with them individually and then most of these points are brought up in the, uh, in the uh, when you're discussing on the roadmap ahead. So perhaps in the in the follow up discussions in the upcoming years or upcoming quarters, you'll be like we're going to discuss this anyway in the roadmap discussion, right? So uh, I see that you know stakeholders kind of see that you know. Uh, so in two ways, this kind of, I feel that it is redundant. One is that it eats up a lot of my time. I, I definitely understand that, you know, it helps smooth, smoothen up the conversation when I'm there with a lot of folks. For one, that it uh, takes up a lot of my time. And secondly, I could see a bit of um, a pushback from the stakeholders when when they come back and say that we're going to discuss this in, in a couple of days. So why do we want to do this separately now? I, I've got, we've got to, why do we have to have two discussions rather than we can have one? Yeah, um, and you're correct. Uh, there, there was no, there was feedback, um, I think, not, not a question, and absolutely correct. Uh, and the higher uh, level of uh, an executive you deal with, the less 
the, the more difficult it is to get any of their time, and, and, and you're, you're correct. What I like right. to do, and, and this is why these five kind of go hand in hand. Um, if, if you remember, my number one um, tactical tip was to build a relationship, right? <clears throat> to um, basically get the trust of your stakeholders, uh, which includes only your mistakes. So through that, you're building the trust. I personally, I hate official meetings. I think no one likes meetings, I think, but I have a specific hate for meetings. I just, if it's not necessary, there's no need for a meeting. As a result, I'm in meetings all day, so it doesn't really obviously work. But what I like to do is, um, I learned this from a friend of mine who's a nurse. And she does, at the end of every shift, she does her rounds, right? So she knows her patients and she will go from door to door and just check in, just say hello. Make sure her uh, her patients are you know doing okay. Um, what I like to do once a week, um, and I don't get to do it every week because I've been out of town a lot lately, but what I like to do every week, and uh, we're lucky enough because we are in, in four different buildings, but all of, our, all of my major stakeholders are kind of in one building, that's in an eight-story building. I will literally start at floor eight and just make my rounds and go all the way down to the main floor and just see if I run into people. Um, I personally get more done in five-minute conversations that are not on the calendar than I do in big official meetings. Um, I get more done in elevators than I get in official meetings a lot of the times. Uh, so it doesn't have to be, if you call the CEO of your company and you see I need one hour of your time to tell you what I'm going to tell you again in a couple of days, uh, his secretary will probably say no, because <laughs> that hour is value, very, very, very valuable. But if you're just walking by his office, and he's sitting in there, you pop in for a couple of minutes, you kind of get a feel for what, what he or she, um, it, what their feedback is on this product. You, you soften the blows that way. You, you ease them into these things. So I'm not a proponent. I'm not saying schedule meetings with your stakeholders before you schedule meetings with your stakeholders. What I'm saying is if you have that relationship, if you build the trust and that interaction and that one-on-one, um, you get to talk to them offline and a lot of the times you get that offline before you get to the large meetings. And when you have the luxury, and again, I've been very fortunate because I've been at the same company for over 10 years, you get to know stakeholders. So as you're building a roadmap, as you're building an idea, a solution to something, you start thinking, oh, so-and-so is not going to like this, right? You already know before you talk to them because you have history with them, um, in which case, you go to just them. I'm not, I'm not suggesting go to every single person that will be in that meeting, but go to your big stakeholders. Go to the ones that could disrupt your, your, your projects. Uh, but by all means, uh, the less meetings, the better. I'm, I, I'm an advocate for a lot more shorter meetings and unofficial meetings. Example. Absolutely. Uh, hi, Adil. Hello. Uh, this is Zafar. Uh, my, hi. Uh, so uh, my question would be, you know, like uh, considering a scenario where, uh, you know, it's very top heavy uh, organization and, uh, you know, when it comes to decision making, it's very, you know, like top down. What would be your tips, you know, because uh, uh, I mean, there are there are uh, companies where you know, like founders are kind of uh, you know genius, and uh, I don't know, maybe like you know very popular. So uh, they kind of you know drive most of the decisions, uh, uh, you know, in the company. So now uh, uh, you know, like most of the times when you are in a meeting, what happens is uh, uh, you know, like uh, you'll see you hear arguments like, okay, it's already been approved by the founder. So what what tips or you know techniques would you suggest you know to handle these kind of situations? That's a tricky one. Um, I haven't had that problem much um, from, uh, from my personal experience. Um, again, I like to talk about these things from, from personal experience, not, not as they're taught by the book. That is a tricky one. There is a, um, I think it was Steve Jobs that said, why would you hire smart people and then tell them what to do? No, he said, we don't hire smart people to tell them what to do. We hire smart people so they tell us what to do, right? So there, there's a, just generally, it sounds like a, an issue, uh, and I'm not a big fan of a top-down approach in general. Um, I do believe in a top-down approach, um, again, this is not from personal experience very much, it's just from human nature, that people are driven by the outcomes. It doesn't matter if it's top-down, bottom-up, 
at the end of the day, there's someone or some ones who are responsible for the outcomes of certain things. If it's a for-profit company, there is uh, the outcome is profits, obviously, right? If if it's a publicly traded company, the outcome or the final result that is supposed to take place is uh, increasing shareholder uh, prices, right, or, or shareholders' uh, investments. So there's always someone responsible for these things. So while I haven't had a lot of experience personally, because again, I got I'm an extremely lucky guy in the in the professional spectrum. Um, I do believe that in a in a top down or regardless which way, I would identify who is responsible for what and then create a value proposition for them. If it's a boss of yours, well, obviously they want to look good. If it's their boss, they want to look good. Um, and I would also like to say that I think arguments are healthy. A lot of people, I think, shy away and run away from arguments. Now, I'm not talking about mean-spirited personal arguments. I'm talking about healthy, productive arguments on development, on the future of the company, on the development of products, on, on ideas, and all these other things. So just kind of in general, I'm a big fan of arguments. I love arguments. When, we, when we're constructively... Um, arguing our points and, and trying to come up with the best solution. Um, I guess that was my long way of saying I don't really have a good answer for you. I, I, I would personally identify who has the most to, to gain from the success of what I'm trying to build and work with them as much as possible. But I, I just got lucky and haven't been in that situation very much. Okay, thanks, thanks a lot. Uh, mm -hmm. Another question, uh, if you have time, uh, Yeah, I'll just go ahead. Uh, uh, I think I'm losing you. I can't hear you. Yeah, yeah. So I'm asking if you. I mean, like you know, I'll I would rather you know ask another question. Uh, so uh, my question would be, let's say you know, if you, you are the me? first. Uh, yes, I can hear you. Can you hear me? Hello, can you hear me? Hello. Yes, yes, I can hear you. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you now. Okay, so my question is, let's say, uh, you know, if you are the first hire, uh, so apart from, uh, uh, you know, coming up with solutions, uh, uh, you know, you'll, you'll, you'll be driving operations most of the time. Uh, and, uh, you know, I mean, it could be months or years, you know, before you get, uh, you know, some help. So what would be your advice you know, to, to folks like that? You know, or maybe, you know, you have, you have shift, uh, uh, you shift, I know you switched to your uh, business unit and then you are, you know, like you're basically managing a new business unit, and then you are the one doing everything. So, what would be your tips for for such folks? Um, a lot of a lot of it seems that a lot of people think that if there is no direction given to you, or, or given to us from our higher ups, our our bosses, our managers, that that means you cannot proceed, you cannot move forward until you have that direction. I like to look at it as the exact opposite, which is that if there is no direction given to you, you get to determine the direction. Right. That doesn't mean you're just going to, you know, wild, wild west, go off and cowboy your way into whatever you want to do. But you get to, at the very least, heavily influence what direction you want to take your team and your product in. So um, I, I, I think while it is a lot of work, it's a lot more work, when you're first in, when you're first hire, when you're going to be doing things yourself for a while, that's actually a benefit. It can be a benefit because you get to more thoroughly influence what or where you take your company, where you take your product, where you take your team. Now, the problem is that we are humans. There are only 24 hours in a day, and we have to sleep about five to eight of those hours. So there's not a lot of hours to get everything done. So I, I think in that case, it becomes extremely important to prioritize what you want to get done. Um, I like to keep at all times, a, um, I, I used to call it a five-year plan, but then I stopped calling it a five-year plan because I don't know if it's going to happen in one year or 20 years, but a plan, a kind of a, what, I, uh, what I'm now calling ideal stage plan. And I look, at, I look at where do I want to take this series of products, this portfolio of products, wh what is the ideal stage? Where do I want to see them? And when they're there, I say to myself, you know what? job well done, we're done, we're going to go do something else, you know, coach soccer or something. And the beauty is that you will never get there, right? So whenever I have 
competing priorities, I like to stand, set back or sit back and kind of take a larger look at what is most important. I, I hate starting my days with emails because emails are so reactive and i think just in general uh, it is it is if we're always reacting to things we're focusing on the wrong things so if you are the only person doing the job at your company it is very very important to prioritize what you want to get done when um and, and work off of that but please don't look at a lack of direction given to you as a negative. I would look at it as a positive because, again, we go through the five tactical uh, uh, things, and it starts with uh, building relationships, but that's secondary. In this case, the most important one is being an expert in your field and your market. So you should be giving your company the direction and where they want to go, not the other way around. That is not possible in most companies, especially like the you know the, the top top-down model that, that we discussed just a few minutes ago. Um, but if you are the foremost expert in your field, in your company, um, then a lack of direction is not a negative. It would be a positive. Take advantage of it and go with it until someone tells you to stop. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Absolutely. Hi, Dan. This is Garima. I Hello. actually don't know if it's a little off topic, but I had a question in my mind, and since you're so good, I wanted to ask you. So uh, regarding the user experience and user interface, a lot of product management jobs now require a good knowledge of UX and UI. So what are your thoughts about it, and what are some of the resources that we can use in order to learn more about UX and UI? Yeah. Um, excellent question. So, at, at Western Governors, we uh, we have always had a dedicated department, uh, you know, in, in UX UI. But I'll be I'll be honest. I I was actually one of the last people to get on board with. We need to start with UX UI. So, um, to answer your high level question first, the use of your UX UI resources is absolutely. I, I would say. Uh, it's it, it's beyond important. It, it could be the second most important, if not the top thing you need to always consider, right? Because mm -hmm. what's the easiest way to get people to not use your product? One, it doesn't work, right? <laughs> it says, click this button. I click the button. It doesn't do anything. I'm going to stop using you, right? And the number two thing, and those are interchangeable, really, is I cannot figure out your website. Um, I cannot figure out your product. I cannot figure out your whatever it is. I got it. I'm holding it, and I can't figure it out. And I'm gonna stop using it. Um, I like to. Uh, uh, I was just in Vegas a couple of Las Vegas a couple of weeks ago for not for fun for work. And I remember sitting back and looking at uh, there was a there was a uh, a class being taught, and the class was taught by a casino on how to play blackjack, right? And they were giving him the insider information. You take a card in this. You don't take a card in that. Um, they wanted them to become better um, uh, players of, of blackjack. And I remember thinking, why would a casino do that? Uh, what, do they want to lose money? If you're a better blackjack player, you'll win more money. And then mm -hmm. it kind of hit me. It, it's because they want them to feel comfortable. So they'll keep coming back because they think they know what they're doing. As a result, casino makes money. Now, bad example. Bad example, <laughs> uh, right? But I think the use of U, uh, UX UI is absolutely, it, it should be uh, number two. It, the product does have to work. If I click the button, mm -hmm. it has to do what I need, to, need it to do. Now, as for resources, like I said, we're lucky because we're using internal resources. We have a whole development team internally. But this is such a hot topic right now that there are, uh, there are a lot of resources on the internet around mm -hmm. it. I haven't used them, so I cannot suggest any because, again, I use the internal ones. But here's the bottom line of the bottom lines, in my opinion. When it comes to UX UI, for product manager, especially anyone in product management, because remember, we know our customers, we know our market, I think a common sense approach is the correct answer nine out of ten times, right? Mm -hmm. um, if you do not have the luxury of having a dedicated UI UX um, department, um, common sense. What would you want okay. it to be? 
that's that's my suggestion there. Yep. Thank you for your response, Adele. Because even at our company, we have like a dedicated UX UI. But I was wondering, what if you know some companies do not have them? Then probably we have to rely on our own knowledge, and then as you said, common sense. Okay. Cool. Yeah, no, it is. It really is the, the common sense. And there's a famous saying that says common sense is not common. I agree with that. Um, but then it's I still I do my own um, customer interviews all the time um, because, you know, we're building products and we're building them for our student base of more than 100,000 people and internally 6,000 employees. But I'm also looking at what is next. You know, what is what's going to happen in five years and 10 years and what, what do other companies want? And mm-hmm. I do my own, you know, I'll, I'll go on Twitter or I'll go on Facebook or I'll go on LinkedIn or I'll, I'll talk to people at, the, you know, at, at a conference and say, hey, I want to pick your brain on what would you want this thing to do? Because 99% of the time they give you nothing new, but 1% and that's the game changer, the 1% once in a while, they'll give you something you never even thought of. And that's when I would ask them directly, like, you know, where would you expect this to be? And here's the other thing, Facebook. If you ever have, this is how I pro. If you ever have dilemma of deciding with again without the access to a, a fully internal uh, department that will do this for you, if you have any questions about how to set up anything, anything regarding UX UI, go look what Facebook is doing. Right, it is <laughs> it's the number one used website I think in the world right now. The number one used app in the world. If Facebook is doing it, chances are your customers are already familiar with it. Um, anything that's not trademarked and copyrighted, I think use it the way they lay things out, the way that the, the things work. Why not? Um, again, what is it like one or two billion users right now? Um, chances are the person you give your in this case software to and say use it. More likely than not, they're familiar with Facebook. So why not put something in front of them that that they're familiar with? Good idea. Thank you. My pleasure. Uh, Hi, Adele. This is Sohasir. Am I audible? Uh, so I think I joined a little late, but uh, a lot of nice insights from your end. So just another question that I'd like to ask is, um, while recruiting PMs on your team, what are some skills that you look at? Because I'm pretty new in the space and just trying to break into it. So what are some mm-hmm. must have and some good to have skills that you look for? Um, that's that's a difficult one. Um, I, I think it's easy, it's easy from my perspective, right? Because I know what I'm looking for and the problem is I don't know what it is until I see it in a lot of cases. What I have learned is that there is, you will never, especially in a, in a larger organization, but actually this applies to small organizations as well, you will never have everything figured out, including the process. Um, we like to get together every couple of months, every few months and say, all right, we're going to develop a process that will be the final process forever. Yeah. And we have this conversation every few months, which by definition means we have never figured out the final process. I'm yet to find a company that has figured out the final process. I think the number one thing I would look for uh, in a product manager is someone who is able to function and exist and, and prosper. I hate to say it that way, but not not... If I want someone, if someone is very good at just, lin, you know, executing linear um, uh, processes, that's good, but that's usually not product management. Um, I would, in a product manager, what I like to see personally, what I think makes the best product managers are individuals who can take nothing and make something out of it. And that's chaos. Right, that that's gonna cause confusion. That's gonna cost money. Right, that that that's going to um, uh, potentially put your company at risk. So, someone who is trustworthy, uh, someone who can not not just survive in chaos. It's one thing to survive, but prosper and strive in chaos when nobody else knows what the right thing to do is. This person might not know what the right thing to do is, but 
I have confidence and we have confidence that they will figure it out. There's a, there's a semi-famous saying that says, I, I know who I am, I know where I've been, um, and I know where I'm going. I don't know how to get there yet, but I'm confident in my ability to figure it out. That's kind of the larger approach. And that's a very, very, in my opinion, difficult thing to figure out during an interview process. Um, very difficult. So I know that wasn't a good answer. That wasn't a, that, that wasn't a black and white, here's what you're looking for, but that's what I'm looking for. And honestly, that's not just product management, that's just in general. If I'm hiring uh, anybody for any job, uh, that applies in my opinion. But maybe not in like an accountant. If you're hiring an accountant, you don't need a problem solver. You need someone who's very good with spreadsheets. But uh, in a product management role, I, I, you know, going back to the mini CEO role, that is, I think, the absolutely most important thing um, that 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 anyone can have. Got it. Yeah, I think I think I understand what you're saying. Uh, if I can just follow this up with a very simple question: uh, If there are any three things that you'd like to tell the audience, or I'm asking for from more from my end, would there be any three things that you think we could prepare on? It's very difficult, I understand, but uh, if if mm -hmm. there is something that you know, if you could suggest that we can do to get there. Mm -hmm. Uh, three things you would so oh yeah sure to get better as a product manager or to get hired as a product manager uh, both actually but yeah, <laughs> okay. I'm trying to okay. okay. yeah. all right very cool um, look the number one thing is is very simple really it is the expertise portion why 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 would I hire someone who knows less about something than I do um, you know, the, the famous saying is you never want to be the smartest guy in the room because you're in the wrong room. Um, I have no problem because I'm never the smartest guy in the room. Uh, but there's that. Number one thing is, let's say you are, and it doesn't matter what it is. This is when it helps when you work in an area where you're passionate about because this this is not work. This is fun. But the number one thing is absolute expertise in your field. If your job is to develop products for headsets, you Google headsets. You should know everything from headsets, from where the materials come from, how they function together, how they work, who sells them for what price, where is the future going? Um, I think in interviews, the easiest way to, to determine someone who is serious about their job versus not serious about their job is to ask them about the future of the market that they're in. If you're interviewing for a job, you know, with, with a search engine, no names, um, you should know not, not just what's happening today. Everyone knows what's happening today, but where is it going? What are your what are your ideas for the future? Where where do you see the market going? You don't have to be correct because most of us are wrong about these things, but that shows that you're passionate about it, right? So uh, those are the, the the one and two things really right there. Um, and then I don't know. I mean, the the rest the rest gets gets a little tricky. There are plenty of certifications and all these other things out there. Oh, here's a, here's a tip. Um, it, it goes right hand in hand with the expertise thing. Mm -hmm. The internet is such a beautiful and awesome and powerful thing. Yeah. It is so easy to become known. Not not easy, but it's easy to to well get established online. Um, as a thought leader, we call them thought leaders. I'm not sure why. Um, you know, through LinkedIn, that there are, there are different ways to to approach the LinkedIn thing. Through uh, you know, again, Facebook. You can go and create a blog on the fly. You can have a free YouTube channel and record all you want. You can have podcasts and vcasts and all these other things. I think it can be very powerful, very helpful, especially in today's market. Uh, as, as companies are looking for thought leaders and what we call influencers uh, to create an outlet for something like that. Not just for professional development, also for personal development. I, I, I'm not lying when I say sometimes most of my ideas die in my office. Right, because I get up and I do the whiteboard and I start drawing them up or I'll start writing about it and one hour, two hours in, I say to myself, whoa, that was horrible. That was a bad idea. What was I ever thinking about it, right? Um, so creating a channel to let out your ideas, to let the world know uh, what it is um, you're thinking. And guess what? Sometimes you'll write an article and, and like three people will read it. That's okay. It's not just for them. It's also for you. 
So uh, expertise and then being recognized as an expert. And then maybe lastly, and this is not a practical one, but uh, if we give up this notion, we're not all Bill Gates, right? We're not all Steve Jobs. We're not all Mark Zuckerberg. Give up this notion of taking credit for everything we do at all times. Focus on the greater good. Focus on the outcome. Uh, in my example, it's very, very easy because I work at a university and we're a nonprofit university and we serve a non-traditional student base. So it's easy for me to say I'm bought in. My mission is to help the people who are disadvantaged in life get a better education. I'm, I'm in. I'm bought in. Sometimes it's maybe a little more difficult if you're working for for-profit and it's a whole different, whole different thing. But I think just giving up this notion of needing to get credit for everything we do and just focusing on why we do the job to start with. Yeah, thanks so much, Adair. That, that was helpful. Also, just project management skills are a pretty good idea from a more you know hands-on thing. Sure, yeah. It's time to pick those up, too. Thank you for your time. Absolutely, it's been it's been my pleasure. Um, you, um, I think I shared my contact information with you. Uh, this is one of the favorite things I like to talk about. So, please connect with me, follow me. Let's talk anytime. Um, and I just, uh, uh, you know, in general, this is. Uh, I, I do think I believe what I say when I say that this is where the world happens. This is what happens. Product management is where. If it doesn't happen with us, it does not happen in the world. So please, uh, stay connected. Have yourself a great day. Hey, thanks a lot, Adil, for joining us today. The session Absolutely. was very interactive and uh, the insights shared were very useful. And thanks a lot, everyone, for joining us today. So before ending the session, I would like to give you all a little brief about Pragmatic Leaders. So we started this organization with an objective of building a new generation product managers and train them for the jobs of future. So uh, with this, we have built an immersive product management bootcamp where you will be paired up with our in-house development team and you will be allowed to build, build and ship a real product. So uh, this is all from my side. And uh, if you are looking for transition in product management, you can reach out to me and you can anytime reach out to Adil as well. Um, and once again, thanks a lot Adil for joining us. Also, we have very interesting sessions lined up. You can visit our website and you can check out the upcoming sessions and RSVP there.